All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to a very last video before your Year 12 Economics exam tomorrow. We're going to be looking at the recommendations VCAR made in the 2020 exam marking guide. These are things that many students would have probably flipped over without even thinking about because you just get straight to what the multiple choice answers are and what all the VCAR feedback is. But the importance of these things is that if VCAR thinks students were weak in certain areas, they are very, very likely to ask about them again. So we're going to look at specifically all the dot points that they mentioned that students need to know more about or have a deeper understanding about, just to have a quick brief overview of what those things are, just so they're fresh in your mind before your exam tomorrow. So without any further ado, let's get straight into it. So what we've got is so these are we're going to have two slides of the main key knowledge and key skills that require deeper and clearer understanding. So the first thing that VCAR cared about is how a lower cash rate and a higher terms of trade impact the or influences the exchange rate. So these two things are obviously seen as separately. It could be two separate questions, but how a lower cash rate or high, how a higher terms of trade influences the exchange rate. So if we talk about them one by one. So how a lower cash rate impacts the exchange rate. So when we've got a lower cash rate, it means that foreign investors, if our cash rate is lower relative to foreign countries, Foreign investors are going to withdraw their funds from Australian financial institutions in search of a greater return elsewhere. This puts more Australian dollars onto the foreign exchange market and leads to an exchange rate depreciation. So if we had to put that down over here in simple terms, a lower cash rate equals a lower Australian dollar. In terms of high terms of trade, when we have a high terms of trade, it means that the prices we're receiving for exports is higher and or the price we're paying for imports is lower. So if you have a higher terms of trade, an important thing with the terms of trade is that quantities remain constant. So it means that because, and the reason for that is a lot of our exports are commodities, which are inelastic in demand because China needs our iron ore, etc. So if the, we have a higher terms of trade, this means we're receiving more for exports or paying less for imports, which means that we're getting more credits into the economy or less debits going out. That means that if we have a higher terms of trade, it's going to lead to an exchange rate appreciation because more demand for the Australian dollar it takes it off the foreign exchange market and it appreciates in value. Then we've got how a lower exchange rate can influence material and non-material living standards. So if we look at that, material and non-material being the important part there, a lower exchange rate, um, obviously there are a few different impacts there, but for consumers, a lower exchange rate means that we've got less choice or less access to cheaper resources from overseas, which can decrease our actual purchasing power and make us worse off that way materially. Um, and that lack of choice can also negatively impact our non-material living standards. The role of automatic stabilizers in influencing aggregate demand and stabilizing the business cycle. This is all about how automatically the level of welfare outlays and the amount of tax revenue changes based on unemployment and economic activity changing. The government doesn't have to do anything. The second you say the government's done something, you're wrong in an automatic stabilizers question because this happens with no intervention. So it's really, really important. So when we talk about the pandemic and as economic activity starts to fall, unemployment starts to rise. Therefore, the government receives less tax revenues and has more welfare outlays. And that begins to main, that helps maintain the amount of um, income in the economy and maintain aggregate demand and helps stabilize us from a contraction and hopefully move us back into an expansion. And then in an expansion, as people start to get onto a job, and they move onto a working income, they will begin to pay more tax while the government has less outlays through welfare. That will begin to obviously then move us into an expansion and then eventually that will cancel out and go into a contraction. Um, one that I think will be important in this year is evaluating the effectiveness of AD policies in achieving the goal of full employment during 2020. Um, strengths and weaknesses being specific strengths and weaknesses in the study design that you can point out. So with um, AD policies, budgetary and monetary policies have specific strengths and weaknesses. When using them, you need to be really specific about saying those strengths and weaknesses. So impact lags, implementation lags, political bias, um, targeting specific sectors, those kind of things. The importance in achieving full employment is I think this can come up again because hypothetically with statistics, if you look at the 4.6% rate of unemployment, technically we're achieving the goal. But if you look at the underemployment rate, it's about 12.6% and the labor force participation rate is falling. And what that means is that although people are employed, they're not working to capacity. And therefore, although technically we've achieved it with the data, we're not really in a state where full employment is being achieved. So if you're evaluating that, you'd really be weighing up those things to talk about the data in depth to say whether or not it's being achieved. 
Then explain the relationship between efficient allocation of resources and aggregate supply. This was a question on the exam. We went through this in the poorly answered questions on the 2020 exam. Um, really should tie this in with types of efficiency. So two types of efficiency to say how that would impact aggregate supply. So if we increase our technical efficiency, how that would affect aggregate supply. If we increase our allocated efficiency, how that would impact aggregate supply. So talk about types of efficiency. All right, and then next up we have how spending on training and education and investment in infrastructure influence the goal of strong sustainable economic growth. With these, it's just about that increase in productivity or efficiency, more output per unit of input, and therefore we are more we increase our productive capacity and we are more able to produce. The nature of a perfectly competitive market, this is just the preconditions. So your three main preconditions, being able to talk about them why they make things perfectly competitive, how they impact prices and living standards, etc. So that's the many buyers and sellers, resource mobility, homogenous goods, um, the role of relative prices in the allocation of resources and the effect on living standards. So the change in selling price compared to um, in one good compared to another, how that affects the allocation of resources in consumption and production. For production, producers are always going to reallocate resources towards the more relatively profitable good. In consumption, consumers are going to go towards whichever one is relatively cheaper as it will maximize their utility and therefore improve their living standards. The strengths associated with the use of markets to allocate resources this is basically that um, it creates a situation where um, dynamic efficiency is going to be achieved as businesses are most likely to um, businesses are most likely to uh, allocate the resources towards the goods and services that need to be produced. Um, also, it's going to keep costs low because there's so much competition that businesses have to cost cut if they want to be competitive. Um, also keeps prices low for consumers, therefore maximizing living standards. The role and effect of government intervention in a market to address market failure. So indirect taxation, subsidies, government regulation, government advertising, it's what it does. Um, that's not actually that difficult. And the interpretation of demand supply diagrams. So knowing, this is an important one, knowing when things change, how to talk about that change. So when you have a favorable shift in demand, if we have price, and quantity happening here. When we first have a shift in demand, at first there's just more demanded at the same price and that creates a shortage and then consumers bid up prices until a new equilibrium is formed. Being able to talk about that shortage or surplus that occurs first when a shift occurs is really important. That's where a lot of students lose out on marks. Then we've got students are advised to look closely at the development of a better understanding of the following terms and concepts. So we've got the meaning of the terms of trade, terms of trade being a ratio of the average price received for exports over the average price paid for imports. Like I said before, quantities remain constant. So quantities constant. So when the terms of trade changes, the amount demanded and supplied is still the same. So if export prices increase, it means we're just receiving more export credits, which is favorable for aggregate demand. The difference between the terms of trade and the balance of trade, terms of trade just being the price that we receive and pay, where the balance of trade is what's actually coming in and going out. So the balance of trade is actually the dollar values coming in and out, whereas terms of trade is just the prices being paid. The difference between a current account deficit and a budget deficit, current account deficit is just the international transactions occurring in an economy, whether it be through trade of imports and exports or incomes, etc. Budget deficits, the government's revenues and outlays and the balance of those. The difference between production and productivity, production is a value, it's the total amount produced, whereas productivity is a measurement or rate of production. So productivity is like the inputs, outputs per, inputs per unit of output. Public debt versus foreign debt, public debt's government debt, it's everything the government owes to overseas nations, whereas foreign debt is all public and private debt together, that's the total debt of a country, that's net foreign debt. The CAD versus net foreign debt, the CAD is just the a record of how much money is coming into and out of a nation over the year, whereas net foreign debt is from overseas borrowing and how much we owe and need to pay off in the future. Net foreign debt affects the CAD because we have to pay interest on that, which is a net primary income debit, but net foreign debt is separate to the CAD. And that's it for all the things that um, BCAL wanted us to look at, talk about, things that you need to know for next year. So hopefully this is helpful at making you think about those things. Good luck for your exam. I hope you do well. Um, I hope my students do well as well because I want to get great scores because it makes me look good. And that's what's really important here. On that, I hope you have a wonderful night. Get some rest, relax before your exam. Don't cram too much. And I will see you probably never again unless you come back to see the exam answers when I do those. Catch you later. Bye.